Hello, and welcome to another great Noman live event. There's a crowd here. You're going to hear them right now. Here they go. No rehearsals, if you can believe that or not. I want to thank everyone online tuning in. And of course, I want to thank everyone here for doing that, because you all could have been silent, and that would have been real awkward. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Lenovo and AMD. Without them, we wouldn't be able to bring you, the viewer, and all of you here such amazing events, such as the amazing event that's happening tonight. If you're in need in close ca of closed captions, go ahead and head over to our Facebook stream or if you're on our YouTube stream, you're already seeing them. So now, I actually talked with uh, uh, the, the people to my left a little earlier about what I was going to say, and, and we were coming up with different ideas. And, and, and um, the only thing that came to mind was I actually saw this movie uh, when it came out. I have a, a beautiful daughter. Her name's Evelyn. She's six years old. And she likes going to see animated films. So I see a lot of animated films. And generally, the way that it goes is when I go and I see these films, um, she asks me a lot of questions, you know, she becomes disengaged, I become disengaged, I talk to her and so on and so forth. But in this film, I remember sitting in the theater and I was enthralled by the movie, it was very, very good. And I'm watching it and I'm just really locked in and I'm sitting there and I'm eating popcorn and I'm staring directly at the movie and at one point I put my hand in the popcorn and I feel this tiny little hand collide with my hand. And I look over and my daughter's doing the exact same thing that I was doing at that moment in time. And in that moment, I saw myself through her, and this movie, I'm not going to spoil anything, but this movie, as I'm watching it, I, I was legitimately engaged. I didn't feel cheated. I didn't feel like they were trying to do, you know, standard story beat stuff or anything. Any, all the jokes really landed. It was very fun, and it was very, very engaging and entertaining, and it gave me something that was very unique. So thank you to, to all of you that have worked on it. But you now get to hear about this amazing movie that came out and that gave me such a wonderful experience. If you haven't seen it, you should see it, but I'm sure most of you have. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you an evening with DreamWorks Animation. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming out uh, and for watching wherever you are. Uh, my name is Mark Edwards. I was the visual effects supervisor for Puss in Boots The Last Wish. And uh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was lucky enough to work with just an incredible crew at DreamWorks Animation, some of who are, I've uh, strong-armed into being here to present part of their work. Uh, so I get the easy job of really just introing and we'll answer questions at the end. We're going to leave lots of time for questions, so think about that. Uh, we thought we'd do something a little different with this presentation and really take a snapshot and deep dive into some of these areas, very specific things. So hopefully you walk away with some knowledge of how folks were accomplishing some of their, their roles uh, and the art and the technology behind it. Uh, and we'll We'll hopefully generate some questions from that too. So, uh, so generally we're gonna sort of step through in these little segments. We have Ludo talking about animation first and sort of the style there and the choices made uh, specifically around the giant fight. Uh, from character effects, Pramita is here talking about some of the fun challenges with fur and chains and wind and skin slide and everything else related to some of our uh, amazing character effects work. Uh, David's here, uh, he's going to really show and break down how the fire curtain worked at the end, which was kind of this really cool stage of the last battle, and actually deep dive into that section. Uh, and then finally, Sandra will talk about some of the lighting choices and really aesthetically and stylistically what we were going for, uh, which the lighting department accomplished uh, amazingly well. So, so I will introduce Ludo to talk about animation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ludo. Thank you so much. We all love each other. It's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, so my name is Ludo. Uh, I was the head of character animation on Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Um, <laughs> I'll take all the claps for all the team that worked really hard on the movie. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we call uh, the giant fight. Um, and and through that part of the movie, I wanted to kind of approach 
how we approach the animation and how we kind of develop the style for the movie. Um, the reason why we picked this part of the movie is because we started with basically with two sequences in production, the two first ones. One was this one, the other one was the, the, the bar scene with the wolf and puss. So I'm, I'm really hoping you guys saw the movie. So I don't spoil it for you, but basically. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna play, you know, over like the final result. I like to start with the end, like any good, you know, current movie, <laughs> they show you the end and then you dive back in. But so basically this part, right? So this part of the movie where, where Puss is basically fighting that giant in the city, running towards the giant, uh, dodging that belt, uh, kind of spinning on it, running, doing the famous cartwheel, <laughs> right? Having a lot of fun hopefully like the audience at that time, and you know, kind of running on him and, and just you know, stabbing him in the back, I'm guessing, right? Cool, so, and what's really, what's really interesting for me in, in this is that last shot where he runs on a giant and, and stabs him, and, um, because it has a little bit of a story. It was pretty much the first shot we did in animation that kind of triggered that, um, uh, that style and it actually made it to the movie, which that shot wasn't in the movie originally. We had the fight uh, storyboarded, the directors were working on the, uh, on the story, and we were working like developing the visual style of the movie, the, the animation style that would go with it. Uh, and Christopher, uh, our um, head of uh, previs, kind of came up one day and he's like, hey man, I have a super cool idea, like it's really, really cool camera move where Puss would jump from the giant and kind of go, you know, just go there and then uh, stab him. Yeah. Yes, cool. So he come up with that shot. <laughs> and I love it, I love, the, I love the camera. And I'm like, cool. The only thing is my, my brain didn't go to the cool camera thing. The, my brain went to like, how can I make the run super cool? And, and I think I, I got probably brought back like, you know, 25 years, I mean, 20 years, let's be gentle on me. Uh, when I was a kid watching uh, anime on TV, and I'm like, I want, I want, I want that thing to kind of run like crazy. Uh, so my, my, first, my first thing was like, okay, how can we push it? And at that point, like, we're, we're still kind of trying to decide on the style. Um, definitely the movie was more stylized, it's gonna, was gonna be more stylized visually, and animation, uh, we were kind of leaning on to, like, trying to at, at least push the, the part that were, um, action related. Um, so that's the first test I, I ended up kind of doing on, on the movie. Um, and it was kind of interesting, like, you know, just trying to kind of find, okay, how do we, how do we push the perspective a little bit? How do we, how do we, how do we amplify the action? And one thing was missed mostly like, you know, the speed of it, like camera, like if we set up a camera, we are probably gonna have to get that camera travel like at least twice the, the, the speed of the, of, of what we, what we're, uh, you know, picturing. Uh, just to get more uh, more speed, um, uh, like a, a, a bigger sense of speed. Uh, also trying to kind of, you know, obviously this this one this one was kind of tried out in step mode, um, uh, where you're basically keeping more more frame keeping more frame out, so we can we can make the posing a little bit a little bit more relevant, and also playing around with, uh, you know, that maybe I can do that then, uh, playing around with like you know kind of duplicate limbs to kind of help reading the animation. So you know, kind of playing around with that. Um, and, and see if it was something that we kind of wanted to go uh, towards that route. So I, I ended up showing this as a test um, at the time to the directors and then Joel turned, I remember like Joel watching it, turned around and he's like, where's that coming from? And I'm like, well, fully Kuri? And he's like, I love fully Kuri, let's do that. So <laughs> that was pretty much it, right? And then, and then the both directors, Joel and Daniel, got very, very excited about the idea of the step, uh, doing step animation for the action, which was a little bit of like, Counterintuitive because it's fast motion. Usually, you you know even in, in the 2D days, you would you would probably animate 12 uh, drawings a second on a regular on a regular shot. But then if you do something action, you want to do one frame uh, one drawing per frame because you want that fluidity. But there, like it was not really a question of fluidity; it was more a question of style. So just for the sake of like knowing where we're going for, we tried both. So I, I took this I took the, the the test shot and put it in spline. So you get a spline at the top, step at the bottom. Hopefully, it doesn't really feel that different when you put them one to next to each other. But the thing that I learned from this was really, if I slow it down, right, you see spline and step. Um, as soon as I put it in spline, obviously the, the spacing and the timing had to change, but the posing also. And I kind of felt like in spline, I was kind of losing a little bit of the punch. So I started, I started to kind of push the perspective a little bit, like kind of deform the character just to try to get the tail close to the camera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously that is like, you know, one of the elements that I'm, uh, that in my head I was like, okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go that route. 
at that time too, like when I was doing it, I'm like, there's no way they go for a step. <laughs> I don't know, for some reason I was doing it in spline. And I'm like, the spline looks fine. You know? um, but they saw it, they saw both, and then they wanted step. And they were like, okay, how can we make it work? And I'm like, it's completely counterintuitive, like, you know, step for fast motion doesn't make sense. Probably never done, be done before, and I love it, <laughs> so let's do it. And then we started to kind of investigate, like, how the style would look like. So, a very boring slide, sorry. But it shows you a little bit of like how we did split the thing. So we didn't want to do a step for the entire movie because it wasn't really the style. Uh, and, and we kind of all felt like the acting, all the acting beats and the emotional moment would be probably better served with a more traditional type of animation. We still wanted to kind of push the timings and the graphic looks based on you know, the look that Mark and the team and everybody was developing at the time. Um, but we went you know, acting in spline, action in step, which also, presented some, um, you know, some difficulties in some ways because we're going to have also to find a way to transition from one to another. Um, so we defined the style, kind of start to an analyze a little bit of like anime. I mean, it was not really super hard for me. I had like a bunch of references, a lot of older ones, like all the gain acts, like Evangelion and, and Furikuri and Guren Lagen and um, a lot of TV shows too, which is kind of interesting because usually TV shows drop even more frames because of budget. Um, but we were kind of researching more the, the feel of it. Not necessarily the execution, but the feel of it. And it's pretty rare in feature when someone tells you, hey, it's cool, put less frames. <laughs> it's, gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> um, so really the main thing is like, you know, it's animation, but like stronger posing, play a lot more with slow and fast mo um, 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 f uh, speed, really. Uh, so you can play with physics, which is something very interesting that anime does where they they do it on anything, like obviously Furikuri does it, but they also do it on very realistic animes. If you watch something like Ghost in the Shell, sort of a stranger, um, they, they do that on realistic characters, which to me was the most important thing, is like uh, we couldn't really get those characters to look too cartoony because of the, the nature of the designs, even though they were more graphic. So that would actually definitely play to, in our favor to be able to kind of push the timing, push the poses without feeling too cartoony and go off style. And they played a lot with the Z-Space, which is what, what I was playing in that test, like really bringing a character across the camera. Um, and you know, that kind of you know, clarity, reading poses, um, the poses are getting more important because you, they get exposed on screen for longer, so you see them a lot more. And the difference in between a shot that has just drop frames, meaning like if I take a shot on 24 frames a second and I just remove frames, the difference between that and a shot that, that would be where the animator would actually go back in and tweak all those frames to make them as great as possible is really night and day. Um, the timing itself, twos, threes, fours, meaning like how, how, how long we expose those frames, is part of the design of the, of the, of the shot. It's not just spacing and timing, it's really just the, how those frames are. Um, camera is a big interaction with the character. Again, anime do that a lot. Like they animate, obviously they animate the camera as well. Um, and all the elements in the shot are part of the animation. So that's gonna be important later on. And I, I did drop that little test we did on Goldie. She was brunette for some reason, the way we, we had her before we got our, uh, our texture. But uh, we were planning, we were playing in, uh, with like drawings instead of just the multi-limbs. Uh, and that was kind of a successful test. Like, and again, we did put in this situation like, you know, the run is on twos. And usually your run would be on ones. Like even, even something like Spider-Verse, you see them running from profile, they're on spline, they're tw for 24 frames a second. So we're really trying to kind of hit that stylization. Um, how did we cheat perspective? So the perspective aspect was pretty interesting. So we, that's a little bit of like how we did it. And, and the goal was to basically tr streamline it. So if you take, uh, when, I, when I was thinking about how much I had to tweak that character in that test, I was like, I was thinking right away into that bar scene where Puss is doing the card wheel, and you do the card wheel there, and on every frame on the, of the card wheel, we have to kind of push the head bigger, but then the next frame, the foot is bigger, and the head is very tiny. So how can we just find ways to kind of streamline it so in animation we can iterate and still put like a, a very, very quick layer of perspective on the character? We couldn't really do it through camera only because the, the, you, get, you get to a point where when you get to a 12 millimeter, 11 millimeter, you only end up like deforming the background and the character doesn't really change anymore, but you're just distorting the image so much that it had to be done through the character as if we were drawing it, obviously. Um, so there's a little bit of like, you know, we had sliders where we could just like put like, you know, head bigger, boot smaller. And obviously that was kind of that first layer and then on a, on a final layer in animation, we would just have to go in and hand, uh, 
it's called basically. I have a little bit of like some, some dir dirty laundry. <laughs> some people will call it magic, I'll call it dirty laundry. Um, of, you know, screen left, you get the camera, screen right, you get how the character is in screen space. So you see the boots, they don't look like they're three times the size, but if I don't do that, then you don't get the perspective, right? The tail is the same. Um, I, I have some frames where you look like, a, like an obese raccoon kind of running with like one boot very tiny in the front and, and giant at the back, you know, same thing here. Like <laughs> you, you, it, it came to a stage where the animation works, the timing works, but then I would go back on every frame and like, okay, how, how do I just distort this to make this frame look right? And that's, again, something that anime and Japanese animation in general does really well is like they, they don't really animate like, like the traditional Disney animation. They really animate like from a drawing to a drawing and how they interact in frame. Um, and, and again, another example, like, you know, how, you know, kind of dra drag that foot, scale that boot just to get that effect. Um, and, and even like tucking that knee so I could see it on the other side, but I could still get the, that boot to look exactly the way I wanted. Um, in, um, in perspective. Um, and even at, yeah, the last pose, the same thing, like the, the hand and the sword are pretty much like twice the size of their regular size and then the, the hand at the back. Um, well another thing, <laughs> this one is funny. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, sorry, it's at the end. Uh, but you can see how distorting the character doesn't, you know, if we were doing that on the camera, it would be, people would be nauseous in the theater. Um, another aspect of it is tracking. So um, we have, Another problem with, you know, the character is moving 12 frames per second, so it, it's held in space every two frames, let's say. Camera is still moving 24 frames a second. If we drop frames on the camera, then it just feel like someone recorded the video and then just dropped, right? It just looked at back, bad, bad frame rate. So on, on that early test, I basically animated him every frame to kind of track with the camera, but the, the reality is for production, we had to find a way to make it work. So we, we developed a tool that was kind of gluing the character. It would detect the, the timing of animation. We had like a way of like indicating which frames were the, the real one and which frames were held. And then the tool would just basically take the character and the camera and kind of move them as a crane, like move the character with the camera. Um, so at the bottom, you can see the character strobing. That's what you would get without, without the tracking. At the top, you get the tracking there. Um, it's also a tool that we use to communicate with other departments that need a spline animation to work, so they could actually replicate the, the drop frames and, and kind of have the same result on screen. Um, another element was adding lines. So the, the, the line addition it was interesting. Like we explored, we explored the multilim aspect. It was great, but it felt a little synthetic, plus we had fur on the characters. The, the movie was starting to kind of get very, very painterly at that point. And we're like, okay, let's do brush strokes to kind of complement the animation. And, and the, the, the reason why the lines became important is like, you know, the lines were dropped by animation on those renders, which are like our renders, but then you go in the movie and you get a lot more details. And the colors change and you start to get a rim light on the character. So how did we adapt to it, right? So the, the, goal, the goal of the lines are, you know, we, because we're dropping frames, like if, if there's an arc of the arm doing this, like I, I get a, my keys back and my, my next key is here. I don't give the information of what the arm is doing in between. So the drawing is here to indicate that to the audience, right? Um, one of the tricks that we found is that, uh, you know, we discovered is to make the image readable and feel like we're not dropping frames, something has to move on every frame, no matter what. The character can be on twos, but then drawings might be on ones and complement the animation that way. Uh, camera motion, FX, anything. So like animation suggested, for example, like those little bits and pieces coming to camera, and then when, when lighting uh, came in and FX was doing their work, they kind of, you know, in indicated that in the final, uh, final frame. Same thing here, you know, that's how we visualize the animation. We don't have any texture, but then you get lighting in there and then suddenly, boom, you get a, a giant amount of, uh, of details and then the lines have to adapt to that new render. So the, the workflow was we, we would do temporary lines over those renders, and then when, when the final look would start to come in, we would just like re, um, reconsider the lines and see how we can actually make them better. Um, so that's an example like lighting on top and what we call anim temps on, on at the bottom. And there's a lot of like drawings, um, I think I can probably pause on this, like where, where Puss is kind of jumping here, right? That's Originally, I did put one on the tail, right next to his tail, but then you start to have like all those crazy destruction thing, and I had to put that little drawing of the tail in the corner so we can actually understand that the tail was there and it's gonna jump. So it just, those little like visual tricks to be able to kind of guide the audience so the animation is still readable, they can still understand what's happening. 
And, and those lines were basically driven by animation and comped in by our amazing um, After Effects department. Uh, sometime over lighting, sometime we had the luxury of having the final lighting render or, or close to final um, to be able to pick the right colors. Sometime we just had to kind of guess and then, and then adapt on the way. Um, other example of lines, uh, they ended up being pretty uh, heavily used on the first two sequences. We reused them to kind of complement the animation only on step animation, and then we ended up kind of doing more and more over even spline animation to kind of stylize the motion blur, et cetera, et cetera. You can see an example of like on the top r uh, left, you can see like the, the blur, it's basically brush stroked in. So it, uh, you, you're not supposed really to see it, but you just feel it, right? So, um, and it's really just like a nice compliment. And to be honest, it was a saver, um, kind of saved our butt a little bit uh, <laughs> a couple of times where you do the animation in step and you look at it in lighting and you're like, kind of feel like I'm missing something here. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to draw the sword. <laughs> like, it's just going to be, I can just do it on top of the frame. Um, and, you know, we use that, obviously, throughout the entire movie, during the wolf fight uh, in the bar, and even at the end. The clip at the very end is going, like, it starts with um, no lines. So that's what we had in 3D, right? The multi-staff. And then the lines would just add the blur effect and kind of complement the animation. So that's where we, we could basically react to the animation even later in the process. Uh, by just seeing what was registering and what was missing, and we kind of go back in. And I mean, Mark was super helpful in that regard of like, you know, say, yeah, sure, let's do it. And, you know, just like, yeah, you just do that. Like, you know, just brush stroke over. So, um, yeah, so that's it from me. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and next, Kamita <laughs> is going to talk about the amazing work they did in CFX. She's going to take my Hello. Hi guys, I'm Pramita, and I have been working as a CFX artist for this movie, like a little over two years maybe. And today we're gonna talk about few of the shots, which are pretty CFX heavy towards the end, like few of the climax shots we chose. So the things that you're gonna see in the, in the shots are about three bears, like large characters with a lot of fur simulation on it, and one of the human character, which is Goldie. So before we start, when I say CFX or character effects, what we mean is any kind of effects that we do on a character, we term, a, term it as a CFX. So it can be cloth, it can be fur, it can be any external force field or muscles or skin deformations or anything on top of the animation that makes it look better. But one thing to keep in mind is when you're doing that, you have to be on model and you cannot change the silhouette, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. <laughs> so. <laughs> so first of all, we're going to see the final output that we're going to talk about, which is this. So as you can see in this shot, there is like a huge force field out there, which is pulling the character, which we call Baby Bear, inside it. And there is a very heavy fur simulation with a lot of fur wind. There is a chain that is being pulled out, and that's the key highlight of the whole sequence where he's being saved by the staff. So that's the thing we are going to see how we reached from animation to the final output. All right, so I'm going to go back and see the animation first. It's not going back. One more time. One more time. Okay, okay. So, no, that's the effects. Okay, let's see. Keep going. Okay, there we are. It isn't. Okay. Maybe one, even one more time. Yeah, one Maybe more time. one more time? Yeah, one more. No? Yeah. See, so that's the animation. So that's pretty much it. You have a very tight chain model. As you can see, it's very short and stuck to its neck. There is a staff, and then there is the bear being pulled back. So that's all we have from animation. So this is a foreshortening camera shot. So when you see from perspective, it looks like here's the bear, and here's the staff, and it's doing the thing. But in reality, it was like this. The staff is somewhere, the bear is somewhere else, and it's very far from the actual position. <laughs> and since it's a chain, which is very small in terms of model, it was very hard for CFX work to kind of stretch it and make it look hooked up in the stuff in the reality. So this is how the CFX looks like. So again, all right, it's not looping. Okay, we can see the final product. So here, as we see, the biggest challenge was, you see, it's a chain. So we cannot stretch it like a cloth. The texture cannot be stretched. We didn't want to add more loops because that's like a whole geometry update and we didn't have the bandwidth for that. So the whole idea was to 
keep it the way it is, but yet look believable from this angle. And also the director was very specific to not move the position of the staff because that was the key position and he wanted to be there and everything looked the same. We couldn't go off model either. And you see those doorknobs and that fork and all those blobs on the chain, they had to feel heavy, they had to get stuck. So these were really challenging while doing it in the shot because the positions were no way matching closer. But then yeah, it did turn out well. We did have to put like a Simulation first on the chain so that it kind of hooked up in the force field so that we at least had that, you know, kind of motion up there. And then we somehow placed the staff a little bit closer. We convinced them that, you know, just a little bit so that we can kind of make it look good as the way you want it to in the final output. So he was okay with that, just a bit. And then that's what it is. So other than that, this shot has a very heavy first simulation that you can see pulled in towards the vortex. So we have something like procedural wind that we have used on the first. So first you have the skin that's coming from the animation. Then on top of that, we have something called skin slide. I'll show that in a later slide. You won't be able to see it here. And then on top of that, we have fur. And then the fur is simmed. And then we have a heavy wind on that. And everything together is this. The other thing the director was particular about is when the chain flows up, it has a curvature, it has an angle that you can see, but then at one particular moment, it needs to feel stuck and then that pull needs to happen. So he was very emphasizing on that frame. And then while the pull was happening, I was like, oh, okay, great, I'm stretching the chain. It's looking big, small, the, you know, the links are opening up. So those were the challenges that we had to go back and forth. And that's it. So this is the first shot. So we're gonna see the next one, let's say, it's already hooked in the shot, all good. But now this has to be maintained in continuity, right? Because it's a whole sequence. So that position has to be locked and it has to look the same in all the shots. So if we go for the next, actually this one has some slides you can see. So this is the animation and this is how the difference in CFX. So you see the staff position, it's a little bit moving like towards the camera, so I have that bandwidth of pulling the chain. And also they were very particular of not covering the face because expression is very important in animation, right? No matter what we do, we cannot hide the face. So that was another thing. And I was not getting the line correct without hiding, you know, kind of the eyes or the face or the jaws. And I was like, okay, great. But then <laughs> this is what it turned out and that's it. So this is the next shot. So this is the animation again where you know, like Goldie, that's the human character I was talking about. The chain is already stuck. She saved Baby Bear, and this is how it looks. Now, coming to CFX, this is what it is. So you see how the stuff is stuck inside the chain. You have the first simulation on Baby Bear, pretty heavy. But then Goldie is in the opposite direction, right? So we had wind blowing in two different directions in the same shot. The other thing was Goldie's hair. So if you see an animation, okay, one slide back. Is it playing? Okay, it's playing. So you see, it has buns, right? They are right round buns, and the hair loops are circular like that. Like, you know, the root and the tips are together inside the buns. It looks amazing like this when it is moving as a unit, but when you put wind on that, the challenge was, okay, they're all opening up from everywhere, and that doesn't work because that's off model. So we had to make sure that even if you're putting wind on the buns, it has to be like a little bit stretchy on the top, but the tangles have to be a little different, but it couldn't just fly away. So that was another challenge for Golda's hair. And then coming to the cloth, you see how she, she has strips of cloth. So again, if there is wind blowing on strips of cloth, there is always possibility that it goes inside and you know collides and all of that. So these are very niche cloth simulation and you know hair simulation difficulties and challenges that you face in shots for character effects work. And it's gone. <laughs> but so, so yeah, that was there. I don't know if you noticed, but this, like the whole movie, Puss in Boots is a very, like in a very painterly effect. Like the, the bear over there, it doesn't look realistic, right? It has four strands that are highlighted. Like if you've seen, this is the lighting shot, this is the final output of that second movie. So the first strands have different colors, like white and brown in between, which you can very clearly visualize. So it looks great, but when it starts moving in very fast action, it can be really distracting at times. You were like, oh, what is that jitter? But you know, it's actually the color of the fur, you know, kind of making it look like that. So we had to be very careful that whatever we put in on top of the animation, it should look good. So that's the, you know, final take. All right, so one last thing. We're gonna talk about the skin slide that I was saying. So again, this is an animation shot. So as you can see, there are three very big bears, and this skin that is riding on each other is coming from animation. 
Now, when I say skin slide, skin slide is nothing but it's like a process that we developed. It's more about the skin riding on top of animation and it's gonna give you a look of like a muscle inside without actual having muscles. So something like this. It just makes the body way more organic. Do you see that? Like the back of the bear, the neck of the bear and all these heavy muscular areas. And the fur is actually riding on top of the skin slide. So well, I'll show you one more. So here you can see the huge difference between the baby bear's neck you see that? Like when he pulls his arm and all the jiggles and stuff. It's definitely coming from animation because we are riding on top of animation. But the organic feeling is coming out of skin slide. So it's actually kind of a wrapper on top of the animation which is doing that. And then you have fur on top of it. So, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is David. I'm part of the effects department and I'm going to be talking about sort of how we approach this fire curtain uh, in effects. Uh, so this is one of our production shots and I guess in addition to being pretty visually challenging and stylized, the fire curtain also had some logistic challenges to it. Um, so we had it in almost an entire sequence of just over 100 shots. And we also really had like the full gamut of camera angles. So we had close-ups, we had wide shots, we had several overhead shots. And so that sort of added complexity to what we needed to do. And in order to sort of meet our goals, we needed to find a robust solution that was uh, easy for us to iterate with, um, but could also scale really well to meet the demands of the sequence. And so we can start by sort of looking at some of the concepts we received from the art department. And so, ooh, sorry. Uh, we got these really cool stylized fire concepts from the art department, and they were super helpful for us um, as we were starting to plan how we were going to approach this thing. And so in the rightmost image, I've sort of tried to highlight some of the main takeaways for effects from these uh, concept pieces. And so each of these sort of callouts here uh, sort of represents one of our final elements uh, in our, from our effects that will eventually all sort of combine together to make up the uh, final fire curtain. And so in this next clip here, we're sort of looking at a library of elements. And these uh, kind of smaller individual fire simulations were at the core of our setup. Um, and so the idea was we would generate a bunch of these individual fire sims, and then we would take them and instance a bunch of them together to sort of make up the uh, full body of the fire curtain. And so in addition to the fire simulations that we see in the top row, we also made a low polygon uh, geometry version of that simulation. And we also provided a particle simulation whose motion sort of represents the velocity field of the underlying uh, fire simulation. And with those three representations uh, per library element, uh, we made sure to give all of them unique labels and the setup that we built for the fire curtain was able to, to use those labels to swap uh, from between representation uh, sort of on the fly as needed. So sometimes we would use the full uh, fire simulation and at other times we would use just the proxies. And so, and the same for the particles as well. And so this is sort of how we would approach a fire shot from the ground up. So in image number one, we're sort of looking at the geometry that we would receive from upstream departments. So we have our characters from animation, and we also have our environment geometry from uh, layout. And we can also see that we have this sort of red placeholder geometry, and that's what the fire curtain is being represented by in those upstream departments before it comes to effects. And so when we receive it, the first thing we do is we take that red placeholder geometry and we replace it with a bunch of our um, instance library assets that we just looked at. And so that's what we see in image number two. Um, and since at this stage, our primary concern is shot composition, we're using the proxy geometry representation 
um, of our library elements so that we're able to iterate very quickly uh, and basically in real time, uh, as we can see in the right clip. So that's uh, this clip here. This is sort of an example of the types of edits we would typically make at this stage, and we're really just trying to block in uh, the general composition of the shot and how much fire that we need to see. Sorry, I don't know. I guess that's the right slide. Um, and so once we've sort of achieved a composition that we're happy with and gotten that uh, composition bought off, the next sort of process that we need to do is we need to take our fire curtain proxy geometry and we need to run it through, um, I guess what we called a 3D slash 2D uh, geometry processing step. And the purpose of this step was to take our proxy geometry and then use those labels from our uh, simulation library to swap out the proxies with the full resolution fire simulations. And then we take those simulations, we generate a 3D mesh from them, and then flatten it all onto the camera plane. Um, and then once we have this flattened geo, we run a 2D operation that essentially cuts out the silhouette of all of our fire, and that leaves us with sort of what we see in the bottom right here. Um, and then once we have this silhouette geometry, we add some sort of noise break up to the edge to more closely match the concept art we received. And the final step here um, that we see sort of in the top right clip is since we have geometry that's uh, completely flattened to the camera plane, we need to make sure that we place it back in the 3D world so that it sits in the correct position with respect to the characters and the environment. Uh, so in the top right, or the top row, sorry, uh, what we're looking at is a section of our fire curtain geometry, um, but from the perspective of just an external camera. And then in the bottom row, we see that same geometry uh, as it appears through the production shot cam. So if we focus on the top right uh, clip here, we can see that at a certain point, the geometry is being stretched back uh, away from the camera, and that's us taking our flattened silhouette geometry and placing it back in the 3D world. But if we look at the clip below that, as that sort of translation is taking place, uh, from the perspective of the shot cam, the geometry is not changing. So a lot of the operations that we were doing uh, were really in 2D, and it was like affecting the geometry, but not from the perspective of the shot cam. And so that's how we're sort of able to do this sort of hybrid 2D, 3D uh, workflow here. And so we basically took that workflow and applied it to each of the layers of our fire curtain uh, with slightly different parameters for scale and so on. Uh, and this is an example of how our final geometry uh, might look at this stage. And so this is the geometry for the shot we saw in the first slide. So I'm going to step back for a second to talk about another tool that we developed for our show. And so this tool is called Stamp Map, and it was developed uh, early on in the show by our head of look, uh, Baptiste Van Opstel. And to sort of summarize how it works, uh, given an input mesh and also a set of points uh, or point cloud, Stamp Map was able to put textures on the input mesh using information from the point cloud, um, and that's how we sort of applied brush strokes and textures uh, in all kinds of, all different departments really, uh, not just effects. And so this was like a huge part of the look of the fire curtain. So if we jump forward here. Um, our final step, like after generating our geometry, uh, we went back to our library elements and we swapped them out a final time to load all of those particle simulations that we saw. And then we took those particle simulations in conjunction with our final output geometry and our stamp map tool, and we used it to make a bunch of uh, render layers or AOVs uh, for our final compositing in, in, in Nuke. So that's sort of what we're seeing here. This is a combination of our particle simulations and our stamp map tool uh, sort of being applied to our fire geometry. And so final uh, compositing was done in Nuke, and this is a breakdown of sort of how all of those elements uh, sort of came together to create the, the final look. And just to finish up here, uh, these are a few more production shots uh, with final animation, CFX, lighting, and effects.
Great. I'll hand it off to Sandra. Hello, everybody. My name is Sandra. I um, was the first CG supervisor on Puss in Boots. Mark and I spent a lot of time figuring out what this movie was going to look like. Um, I even had a baby, and the baby had a first birthday before we released the movie. So it took a long time. Um, so in lighting, if you guys don't know what that is, uh, we're the people who put the mood in. What does it look like? Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? Is it dark? Is it scary? So um, let's talk a little bit about fear. Uh, one of my favorite things I just saw, um, I looked up, what rating did we actually get? We got a PG on this movie. Uh, and it, it tells you, you know, there's some violence, there's some this, there's some that. But my favorite part was with some scary moments. <laughs> and I think it's probably from this sequence. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry for all of you, might be a spoiler, but that's death. And he's scary. And we were like, wow, we've got a really scary character up here. And we sat down with Mark and the production designer, and we were like, what can we do? How far can we take this? And they said, make the children scream. <laughs> <laughs> we said, yes, <laughs> let's do that. Fully thinking that we would do something, and they'd be like, dial it back. Not once did we get to dial it back. We got a few, push it forward, can you make those teeth scarier? What can we do to make this scarier? Um, so there's a lot of really fun things in this sequence uh, that we did. Um, the glowing eyes here. So we had to figure out, we went off for like, well, what makes animals' eyes glow out there? When you take those photos or you see an animal out there, it's kind of creepy. You see those eyes and you're like, what's going on over here? So we actually had to go look up, what in the world is that? What is happening? It's only inside the pupil, for those of you who don't know. Um, it's light reflecting off the back. Uh, those animal eyes have a special setup in there to get very scientific here. Um, and that is what you're seeing, is all the light that their pupil is taking in being reflected back at you. That's why they can see in the dark and we can't. Um, it's also why you get red eye in photos. Uh, the flash flashes onto the back of the pupil and that's what comes back. Uh, so we're like, well, they want the red eyes. What do we do here? Let's just do the pupils. And then they're like, well, we have all these lightning flashes. Let's go ahead and make the pupils flash when the lightning goes off. And you'll see that in a couple of clips here. Um, the next thing they told me is, hey, we got blood. And I'm like, I've never done blood in an animated movie. That's just not something we do. And I'm like, okay, what? They're like, well, don't make it too grotesque, but it's gotta make, it's gotta be a big thing. This is the first time Puss in Boots has been touched by a blade. He has never bled before, so this is a big deal. This is the moment in the movie where he stops being Puss in Boots. He stops being the hero, because he's bleeding, and this other character is beating him. So it, it's amazing, I've done a lot of tears in animation, and we treated it a lot like a tear. So not too far off, but um, it got this really great graphic treatment. And if you, you can't tell, I'll point it out, there is a really great reflection of the wolf with the glowing eyes here in his pupils. And Ludo helped us out so much with that one, getting that just right so we could, it, it's like those perspective images he just showed you where like the character was really tweaked into a rear, position just to get it to look like this. So we cheat everything. Uh, so don't feel bad cheating things if you're doing CG, because we do it all the time. Um, this sequence was one of the first sequences into production, so it was one that we used to develop a bunch of the looks. And this is one of the really early artworks from uh, Zach Retz. And you can see all these lovely paint brush strokes in here. Um, 
we were sort of going on at the same time as uh, the bad guys, and they were doing a lot of fun stuff too in the background. Uh, and we built on that where we actually asked the look dev department to build that into the textures here so they felt painted with brush strokes and things like that. So that came to us in the environment and we didn't have to put as much in, but we had to complement that with all of our work. Um, and you can see here, this is one of the final frames of the beginning of the sequence. We've got some nice warm light going on here with the candles. Um, he's just found out he's only got one life, but he's sort of consoling himself with a glass of milk, heavy cream, I think. Um, and so we start the sequence really nice and warm and cozy here to give us some place to go. So you won't notice it just watching, but you'll feel that the sequence gets colder as we go through the sequence. And that's really that storytelling, trying to give you that ominous tone that death is there and, and the warmth is leaving. Um, so that's, that's one of the fun things lighting gets to do is sneak these things in. You guys don't notice it, but we, you feel it. Um, oh, what did I do? All right. Um, let's see here. So one of the things we used a lot here, um, we borrowed it from another show uh, and built upon it the graphic rims on these characters. So Ludo talked a lot about stylizing these characters and this became a utility pass for us so that we could um, add this and really pop the characters off the background, give them that nice graphic look and give shaping to the pose that was created by animation. And you can see here that's that added and then he really pops off that background with that really nice graphic rim. Um, next we have, uh, lighting does a lot of volumetrics. We put things in the background to sort of add the atmosphere. Um, and so we had lightning blooming through this window and just the sort of atmosphere in the background. But we knew we didn't want just soft volume back there, like this is what we would typically add. Uh, and we needed something more. So we uh, went about looking for solutions to make this feel a little more painterly. And we ended up building a system in 3D. Um, this was before we decided we weren't going to be rendering the right eye for stereo. So this was a really robust solution that would work in stereo, um, but it also ended up helping us just for continuity across shots and that sort of thing. Um, but the volume cards here, we placed, and it was placed facing the camera. You can see the camera down um, with the little frustrum there, and they were all facing to the camera, and they worked in space. And so it just felt right, and we rendered these into sort of a card pass that we could use, and then we could multiply that into the volumetric. And it's a small thing, but you feel it back there. It doesn't just feel like a single homogenous volume. It's broken up with these painterly brush strokes that a real painter would do. Um, so that was one of the techniques that we carried throughout the movie. And we even used it in something like the candle flames. Here we've got some extra contours going on around the candle flames um, that was developed by uh, one of our nuke experts, Esther. Uh, she helped us with that and then we used these volume cards as well. And you can see playing in this movie um, how we sort of molded those against it and it helped everything with this cohesiveness around these candle flames. And we used any place we had volumetrics, we used this technique. Um, the other thing that we did, uh, we had a lot of fur in this movie. Puss is covered with fur. And fur and CG is a bunch of tubes of hair and they all shadow across each other and we spent a lot of time trying to decide how are we going to shadow these? We don't want to see a lot of these hair to hair contact. It, a painter isn't going to go in and paint each individual hair on the cat. They're going to use broad strokes and just maybe highlight a few little ones here and there and that sort of thing. So we had to figure this out. And we ended up um, going with sort of a base setup that worked pretty well out of the box and only had to be adjusted in a few shots uh, to work with this. Um, and it's a painterly filter, we called it, but it's based on the, 
where did I write that down? Kuwahara um, filter, which was actually originally developed like in the 70s for medical imaging work. Uh, but it basically retains a lot of the data um, in the image while softening it. And here's some really close ups. We did some uh, images to help us in the lighting department, like what is this filter doing? And these were 12K publicity stills. But you can see how it's softening that fur, but still maintaining the shape of the fur and you can still feel that there's fur there but it's really nice and soft and painterly and not um, overly CG. So and then we had um, the surfacing department paint special maps for us that held out these bright guide curves that you see on his belly here um, and then lessened the amount that we did around the face because we didn't want the face feeling too blurred out with this sort of thing. So we got all of that set up um, there with their help. Um, next, we realized that um, a lot of painters paint big broad brush strokes in the shadow areas and they'll add some really interesting colors and things over there to just, um, pop those shadow sides. And so we knew we wanted to do something interesting to just add a little touch. And you're not gonna notice it unless I break the shot apart and show you the little addition, but it just adds some extra nice textural detail onto that shadow side. Um, and so what we ended up doing was uh, projecting brushstroke textures and we spent a couple of days painting fun little brush strokes and then turning them all into textures and we would um, scale it in distance so that the brush strokes on the far back buildings looked like the same brush that was used on the foreground buildings which is challenging um, getting those distances and the scale to feel right because it they're not gonna use a tiny little brush in the background, right? They're gonna use the same brush that they used in the foreground as they did in the background. So we had to get that all right, and then we used these images to molten colors and just break things up a little bit on the shadow sides. Um, and this is a little, this is our more graphic example of it, but you can see here in green the texture um, that we used and then how it got molted in and then we added some to the character here in this one to really um, help with that graphic feel because we went pretty monochromatic in this moment. And then um, the big thing we did in this sequence was our graphic moments where we sort of broke with reality. Um, and we splashed the screen red here. So we spent a lot of time talking with the production designer about how are we gonna transition into this red. And he ended up um, helping us with painting these really cool rip cards to rip the screen as the wolf um, swings at Puss. And this is that moment where he is getting hit by the blade and it's the moment he's no longer the hero and he starts doubting himself. And that's the journey our movie takes us on. So this was a really big moment and we wanted to um, highlight that. And then we thought, well, how do we get out of this moment? We've just sort of slashed our way into this really intense thing. What brings us out of this moment? And so we ran through, uh, the shots afterwards and we found a spot that we thought was just right and it was his puss's sword clattering to the ground and so this is sort of the final you know moment we go into slow motion here he gets sliced you don't realize it until you see the blood and then the the um, sword falls to the floor and that's when we break out of our graphic moment and so it was really fun because at the end of the movie during the fire curtain sequence, um, we do the exact opposite. We take Puss slashing at the wolf and he disarms him and his weapon clatters to the ground. But instead of a red moment, which was more the wolf color, we go for a golden moment with Puss. And so we use these really graphic moments to really build on the storytelling for the movie. And so um, that's, that's uh, Meet the Wolf. Um, that's the, the sequence. I hope there were a lot of children crying. <laughs> I apologize, sorry, but it was a lot of fun. So, um, and with that, I think that is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and
And now I think we have a bunch of time for Q and A. So. Yeah. And I think uh, where's our helper with the cube? Yeah. <laughs> there's a cube that's supposed to go around. Yeah. yeah there's a microphone cube that yeah. should get passed around. Yes. Hey. All right. <laughs> The cube okay. has been constructed. So I think we have a question up near the front here. Yeah. All right. Second row. Yeah, I was just wondering on the more Oh, hang on. Wait, Second real quick, row. so everyone can hear. The cube cometh. Here you go. There you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Just point it towards you. Uh, okay. I was just wondering on the more detailed uh, scenes, what the render times were for, for frame. Gosh, our, our render times weren't. They weren't bad, actually. They weren't terrible. Um, you know, uh, we have a custom render, which is actually now open source, Moonray, moonray.org. You want to get it from GitHub and compile it yourself. Um, but uh, I think a lot of our render times were mostly because of the detail sometimes with our fur edges. We would do sort of 4K renders, right, and scale down. Um, yeah, we did a lot of the character renders in 4K and scaled them down to 2K, um, and that really helped get rid of the noise. Um, it helped cut down on denoising time for us and time spent denoising, which is something no lighter likes yeah, to we, do. <laughs> I think we were fortunate that the style, especially with the painterly filter, gets rid of a lot of Monte Carlo ray yes, trace noise. Yes, that was so, really helpful. So actually, we didn't have to sample as high as maybe we would on more sort of photoreal projects. But. Yeah, and, and typically, so we use something that we call a render unit, which is some machine several decades ago that ran for one hour, and that's now our unit. Yeah. We rendered somewhere around 100 RU for a background frame kind of thing, but in yeah. translation, that could be a couple hours on a machine. So it, it's hard to quantify, you know, how big. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to ask, do you use any Adobe apps in creating this movie? Like the Adobe After Effects or Adobe um, the animation? I'm sorry, was uh, it? Did you use any Adobe apps? Like the, the, the creative Photoshop, like Photoshop After Effects. Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Adobe Adobe effects or yeah. the animation one. We, I mean, most them? of the, so in our proprietary animation package, Primo, uh, that's where Ludo would basically do it. He, yeah. Credit to Ludo, he pretty much did all of the drawings, <laughs> right, in the film, so True. a lot. <laughs> uh, but he would, he would rough those in, in, in Primo with sort yeah. of rough drawing tools, and then we would export those, and then uh, we had a 2D comp t team that was mostly After Effects, right, but they had Photoshop plugins, yep. uh, and would basically fit everything into Nuke as well for lighting. Um, so that was most of the line work was done that way. Art department, art department, obviously. Yeah. 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 Creates all the concept art in Photoshop. Yeah. Um, for the uh, effects department, when you had all of the rendered AOVs, did the effects department get to have a pass and comp to set the base look? Or did you just deliver all of the AOVs and comp did all the work for that afterwards? Uh, no, we definitely took several passes. Uh, so for something like the fire curtain, our deliverable to lighting was actually a gizmo. And so the gizmo sometimes had, depending on what we were working on, it would could contain effects or uh, elements rendered completely by effects inside, and it could also have like inputs, and those inputs would be uh, like geometry we published for lighting to render, and they would plug their uh, their renders into our gizmo to like sort of have those two things mix. Uh, but for a lot of this really stylized stuff, our deliverable was a gizmo. Uh, so we we did a lot of uh, some of the comp work ourselves. Um, so I noticed that the, the trend in, in some modern movies, but especially when you were talking about now with the dropping frames to give it more action and punch, there's another trend simultaneously going on online in which they add frames to other older animations that wouldn't have them, like the 60 FPS. Is there anything like that? Because splining is, is splining on 24 frames a second, or is that even higher? No, it's planned on 24 frames. Um, yeah. I think most animators, I mean, I'm, I'm in the camp of like I... I have always a hard time on you know 48 frames a second movies, or even you know um, 120 hours TVs. <laughs> I'm actually pretty happy with 24. Um, so yeah, 24 frames. It's it's pretty much our our standard. Um, yeah, so we never go higher. Hello. 
Oh. Um, hi, amazing movie. I watched it a total of four times. Thank you. <laughs> um, I noticed with Goldilocks, with her um, outfit, it went from a bluish colorful dress to a brown. I want to know if this is a design choice or there's some type of meaning towards it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so that was something the directors requested. I will say, and I helped manage a lot of variants on this movie. There are so many variants on this movie. Puss <laughs> has a beard. He has a different beard. He has a one-off <laughs> beard. He's got a scar. If you don't notice, it's not visible all the time. And Goldie was the same way. They really were like, look, she's going on a journey, right? And she's, uh, by the end, we want her sort of so bedraggled that she feels like she fits with the bears. So there was absolutely a purpose to make sure that she was brown and sort of less colorful to blend in with her new family. Real family. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, amazing movie. I loved it. Uh, and second of all, I don't know if you guys already covered this since I came late, but I do want to know how did you create those environments that led to the wishing star? How did you make them morph into each other and cool. still kept the characters interacting with them? Uh, so, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this at all, David. I, I mean, I think star. that was a all departments worked really hard together and collaboratively to achieve a lot of that stuff. I mean, yeah, there was effects kind of covering the transitions, um, but I, it really passed through all departments, I think, to make it all work together. It was, yeah, yeah it, was, that, it was tough. That's definitely one of those things where they, they pitch it and you go like, yeah, maybe we can make that work, right? <laughs> like you have no idea how to do it until you really get into it. And so kudos to our effects team and uh, we had Derek Chung and a bunch of people really like prototype sort of early things. And uh, I think that what helped us with that, honestly, is that um, there's some comedic elements there, right? Like it had to be kind of snappy because it was really about sort of the timing for the characters. And uh, I think that just helped us kind of buy that things are all happening at once because it's really, you know, timed quickly, so. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. In the scene of, like the introduction of the wolf, where like the screen flashes red. How come Puss in Boots' eyes were yellow? Yes, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> His eyes are yellow because cat, no, I don't have a scientific we, reason. We, uh, we, <laughs> I, it was specific, right? Like because the wolf's eyes are red, Right, and that's kind of his color statement. Puss's eyes are always, they're really more like a yellow green, right? And so we tried to keep his eyes staying that way, mostly because they pop that way. Uh, like it would feel a little odd to, for them to go red because that was the wolf red color. So that was the thinking behind it, was to just keep him a little more traditional. Yeah, and it's very monochromatic there, so we didn't want to keep the green because we thought that would pop too strong against all of the red, so we had to sort of play with the right color statement there. Yeah. So it was what looks good. And Sandra mentioned, like, we did sort of have these color statements, right? So the red for the wolf and the golden the for gold. puss. And so we use that in these key moments here and there. So. I can't see people, to be honest. Oh. So the cute, um, cute, cute folks, they have to okay. help me. Um, when designing a dynamic action sequence, how do you keep the camera movement clear for the audience with it being so energetic without making sure the viewer doesn't lose the focus of the shot? or it, um, being too motion sickness. And also, a quick question, um, was Attack on Titan part of your reference library? Uh, <laughs> so, I'm gonna answer, Attack on Titan wasn't. Um, I, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough that my references are, are maybe a little older than that. I, I know a lot of people actually attributed to that, you know, the, the, the reference being that. It was really not, um, I, uh, but, so to answer your question about the, the dynamic sequences, I think the, uh, that was kind of part of the process too. Like we, you know, uh, we also made this movie during the pandemic. Uh, for a long time, we didn't have access to big screens, right? So we animate action sequences on our screen as big as they are. They're just not, they're not a cinema, a cinema screen. And then you finally see the shots in the cinema screen and you're like, oh, okay. Like the spacing is like three or four times bigger because the character is bigger. The spacing on screen is much, much, much bigger. So. There was clearly a, um, a lot of thinking into like, okay, how do we make sure the cameras are dynamic, but they're not, don't, they don't move too much. Uh, the, even in the timings of the characters, I mean, obviously I talked about step animation, 
but the reality at the end of the day, when you look at the shots, there are a lot of moments where we are actually on 24 frames a second. We just pose them, we just pose the characters so they don't look like they go from spline to step randomly. But uh, there's a stylization to the motion, but there's moments where you have to kind of compensate for that. Uh, I think, again, animation working with layout, like Chris Dover was our head of previous, was amazing at just like communicating really well. Like I would see yeah. some camera motion, and I'm like, we can't do that. And he's like, why? I'm like, well, because when we're gonna animate it, and we're gonna be on twos, it's gonna strobe. And he's like, okay, how can we do it? And I, I, think, I think for the camera work, it was a lot of the time, it was just communicating with him about, okay, you, you want the camera to kind of push up, can we, change the rotation of the camera to a translation. So we don't, we don't spin, we don't move that background as much. What moves most is the character, right? It's trying to find that balance of like what moves, what doesn't. And then it's also where the lines and the effects, because I mean, a lot of the time I would look at shots and, and, I, and I would think about, okay, we're gonna need lines here and there to kind of compensate for the animation. The effects department would do their work and then suddenly you have so many elements that complement what animation is doing that, um, that you know, we didn't need to do as many uh, lines, for example. But that's really just like, you know, it's a multi-layered process, really. Um, I think the goal, the, 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 the thing that I ended up uh, thinking about was more, we need to achieve this, <laughs> and if it doesn't work, I have to find a way to make it work, versus, oh, it's not gonna work, let's find, a, you know, let's find another version of the animation that would make it work. So it's really just like, defining the goal, stick to it, and then, you know, and you just kind of, you know, a bit of luck, a lot of talent, I'm well, guessing, from everybody, and you know. Like you mentioned, it's a lot of collaboration, yeah. so I, I think everybody has sort of a goal in mind, right, for the shot, especially yeah. coming from Joel and Daniel, who are very specific about certain moments, and it's a lot of problem solving, so sometimes it's like, hey, like you said, effects, like maybe effects needs to lead the camera here, right, and give yeah. you a pass for Anim exactly. to, to follow, but it's, it's really iterative, so we never sort of just like lock the camera and say, here yeah. you go. It's like, hey, I animated and I need to change the speed of the camera. I need to make it twice as fast, right? Can we yeah. go back and do that? Yeah. And so we had fake roofs, right, for that run towards the giant. Oh like yeah, we yeah. had like yeah, we ran basically runway, the, the right? city, yeah, but <laughs> like hey, the, the, the houses are not long enough, right? So can we yeah. just like fake so roof things? So we roof. had like fake sunroofs coming in. Yeah. Um, I think one of the big things for animation that was super key was like Sandra, Sandra was fantastic at like providing very early lighting version of the movie, so we could plan on how the details would work out, like, you know, what can we use if there was a rim light on the character, we're kind of using that as an arc, again, through the lines to kind of indicate that, so, yeah, yeah, just a lot of collaboration. And in terms of focus, I mean, that's like, production's iron and a rag, right? I think everybody, yeah. yeah, like, we're all <laughs> really focused on, like, what is this shot about, and making sure the clarity's there, and that follows through in every department. So, like, Romita was saying, if we need to keep the chain out of the, the action of the face because we need to read an expression. Like we watch that, right? So we just kind of make sure every department follows that, what the best version of the shot is. Hello. First of all, Puss the Boots is a beautiful blend of 2D and 3D and I really hope to see more animation like this. Uh, so I'm assuming when making the movie that tries to look more painterly, you want to work with painters, it just makes your life easier. Uh, in Puss and Boots, was it more like working with painters, was it more of a collaboration between 2D and 3D and going back and forth? Or was it a situation where like look dev artists already knew how to paint so they can come in and make it look more painterly themselves without necessarily more back and forth than normally? Does that I, make sense? I think the, the process was pretty similar. I think honestly one of the interesting, because it was such a specific look, getting all of your art department artists to sort of paint in that style was actually one of the first challenges, right? Because they're all a little different with how they paint, right? They have different techniques and everything. So we actually had to align the art department a little bit to make sure they were sort of giving the right reference. But I think the rest of the process was pretty similar to other films in terms of, you know, delivering color keys. And as Sandra mentioned, we tried to make everything um, built into these assets in a real 3D environmental way. So they were painterly and we had a, a lot of extra special sauce like CEO and things to actually break up edges and do some, some fun things. But what lighting worked with was a 3D traditional set. It just looked nice and painterly. So we tried to keep departments in that regular mode. So it, I don't think it shifted too much. I know surfacers are sort of our look dev artists that were actually applying the textures to the 3D. Objects had a lot of fun because it wasn't 
uh, sort of the traditional, like, make it look real. It was very like, hey, I'm going to try this, and look, it's all stampy, and you're like, ah, that looks cool. So, <laughs> so they, had, uh, they, they had a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering when you say you develop tools or you create a system, for example, for the lining or f to change the size of the hat or the boot separately, do you actually write codes and add features to your software or you find new ways of using the features that are already built in your software in a new way? We build things constantly. We prototype. We throw things away constantly. It is a very iterative, iterative process. Um, it, we write code where we need it. We ask more adept <laughs> people to write code. Once we've prototyped something, we get sof our software developers involved. We ask for new features in our renderer, our Moonray renderer. We ask for lots of different things all over the place. So yes, we are constantly evolving our pipeline and creating new tools that future shows get to use and build upon. And so it's just a constantly collaborative environment. Uh. Hi, uh, I'm Boston. I just want to, like, first of all, how are you that good at animation? And, like, how did you, like, make the mouse move and, like, the whistle and the thing? The thing. Yes, the thing. The wolf okay. whistling? Was that what? Um, how like, the, is that, like? Like, how, how they got it, the mouth. The yes. How are you that good at animation? Does anybody have a, an, a something? He's ten, and he's looking at animation. And so I found this, and I'm, sh I'm just he, he paid attention. Um, <laughs> mostly, I just want him to do his homework, so I appreciate all the answers. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I'm thinking he's asking how you got to be so good at animation. Oh. <laughs> Practice. I don't know. Do your um, homework. Yeah. <laughs> do, yeah. Do your homework. No. Right. Um, do your math homework. Well, That's why. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make it too much of a story, but I, I study CG in general. I, I didn't necessarily think I wouldn't necessarily do animation. I mean, especially in the U.S. I mean, I'm, I'm from France, so I, I kind of studied. Uh, I ended up falling into animation. Like I, I had to do a student movie. I thought I would probably do modeling and, and rigging. Uh, and I, and I kind of loved animation. I, I, I was probably not good at the time, but, but I enjoyed the process, right? So I think it's just animation, it's all about process. I think you have to be, I think you have to be passionate about it. I think, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, just to, just to, you know, give you an idea, like on DreamWorks is a pretty fast studio in terms of production on a, on a, on a good week. An animator might do five to three, se uh, three to five seconds of animation a, a per week, right? So it's all about that. So if you, if you spend like a year, year and a half on a movie, you might animate like three minutes, three and a half minutes of animation, right? So I've, I've been in this for like 15 years. Like I actually calculated, I, I didn't have half an hour of animation total in 15 years, which is kind of uh, fun and, and kind of weird. But uh, it's really just about the process. So I, I think to me, it's like, you know, I, I grew into it. I kind of really loved it. I, I didn't even think like I, I would like feature. I wanted to do video games because uh, I thought feature would be like a little slow pace. And I ended up like kind of loving the craft and loving just the, just the details of it. So I think it's just about like, it started with just like an interest in animation. And I think the more, I mean, I, I got lucky to go really early at DreamWorks in my, in my, my life and talking to the animators and kind of di discovering really what it is and, and be even more passionate every day about it. So um, I would say like, yeah, if it's something that you're really into it, I think, I think it's going to take time. Like it's, it's not like, you know, night, it's not like, oh, I love animation. Tomorrow I want to be, you know, uh, super good at it. I think um, I, I, every day, and it's, I'm not saying that to be, you know, kind of negative about it. People are like, oh, really? I don't like what I do. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't like the, the work that I do. Every time I do something, I like it, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, I wish I did that instead. So, you know, there's always a bit of, like, that kind of perfection, perfectionism uh, kind of going with it, and I think that's where the, the passion comes to. It's like, you, you really want to discover something new. Every day I go to work, and I discover something new. Um, you know, as a kid, I loved anime, and I've been 15 years at DreamWorks, and I and I never thought I would do something inspired by anime, and I ended up doing it. So, you know, um, yeah, if it's really what you want, I, th I think it's just dedication. Yeah. Yeah, it is an yeah, 2D animation, 3D animation. 
Yeah, mm. I did. I did. I did. I did two D at school, and I think it's, you know, it, it's a different medium. You're you're not achieving the animation the same way. Um, I think three D opened the door to, to some people that have a real talent for animation, a real passion for it. Don't necessarily have the craft in terms of just drawing, uh, but the art at the end is the same. You, you're still dealing with a flat uh, screen at the end, so you're you're drawing a frame. You're just doing it using digital puppets. Uh, It's great to be excited about yeah. it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's if you like it, just keep doing it. Yeah, exactly. It's a great <laughs> environment. It's a, it's a great industry to be in. Hi. So um, this might be more of a concept art question, but I was wondering, like, no complaints about the style at all, but was there a particular reason that this movie in particular, like of all the DreamWorks movies, was so stylized? Like, it doesn't look like the other DreamWorks movies, and I was wondering, why that leap was made with this one. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, that's you a, job that's right. a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it was, you know, <laughs> it's interesting because this has come out, what, like 11 years after the original? So part of it was there was this, this big gap where it felt like, oh, maybe we can think about doing something different. I think, uh, uh, and it's, it's very clear in the movie, right? This is a fairy tale. Right, and, and I think once that concept was out there, like we're doing a contemporary fairy tale, there was just this whole brainstorm about, well, what does that, what does that mean and what do you think about when you think about a fairy tale? And that led us to some of the you know, previous art and things, you know, uh, sort of European 1400, 1500s art and some of the landscapes there and all painterly. And then we thought, well, can we lean into that? And so we started that direction. And, uh, and of course, during the process, you kind of go too far and break everything, right? <laughs> and then you kind of come back and you're like, okay, well, we really need the character to fit in the world. And there's enough richness with this character. And, um, and you know, we did updates as well. So some of it was about um, not necessarily t style, but some of the design choices. Yeah. So like I always tell, in the original Shrek 2, when Puss in Boots is introduced, he has a cape and he throws it away. And that's because in whatever, 2003 or four, when that was done, mm. capes were really hard and you didn't want to <laughs> simulate it every shot. And you know, that was something we're like, right, Permita, we can do capes. <laughs> <laughs> now we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there were also choices there in terms of design yeah. to be like, yeah, but like, what couldn't we do then that we now feel like, hey, if we open this, this floodgate and kind of change them up a bit, what would we choose? And so that kind of opened the door to say, well, yeah, let's try all these things. Yeah, can we make this look like the concept art the art department yeah. gives us? Because that was the best compliment I think early, right? In the yeah. theater with Joel and Daniel, or you know, you have the still up there, right? You're waiting to play some test shots, and you play it, and it moves, and they're like, "Whoa, we thought yeah. that was art." Yeah, yeah. yeah right. They, they used to <laughs> say that they would come in and like, "Oh, it's cool painting," and then they press <laughs> play, and it moves, and they're like, "Oh, okay, cool." So, yeah. Yeah. so that was good. Yeah. That was. Hi, I'm, hey. Hi. I'm Andrew. I just want to say thank you for your time and your enthusiasm during your presentation. I'm kind of on the fence whether I want to go TV animation or feature animation. I just love the amount of play that you were able to do and as you're like describing the problems you had to solve. I was kind of wondering, oh, my question just disappeared. I had it written down. Basically, I think, um, I think if you could just speak a little closer a little louder, to the little louder. Hi. Cool. Um, my question kind of boils down to the amount of play that was happening between departments as you collaborated, is that something special that came out of this being a pandemic movie, of y'all really having to kind of work across a bunch of different departments <laughs> in a very new way? Or is this it. collaborative, uh, well, it's just, it's I like so make much them collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't have a choice. We actually don't like each other in real life, but then we have no. No, I, I think it was a great question because I, you know, I've been on, so I've been at DreamWorks Animation for 25 years now, and so I've been on a lot of different shows, and, and at, at least from my perspective, it's really important to build teamwork and have yeah. that collaboration and knock down walls, and uh, I thought the question was great actually about, for David, in terms of the effects comp, because in my opinion, I don't care who does the work to tweak the comp to get the right image in the end, right? It should be whoever has the skills and it makes sense and there shouldn't be a lot of like territory and ownership, right? And so if 
FX needs to own it because that's the best place and they need to take care of it, great. If lighting, they're all almost final and they need to little do a little tweak and, and all you do is you say, hey, is it okay, David, if they tweak that? Great. So I think it, it really is kind of um, a mentality of making sure that everyone is open. We're, we're all on the same team and just like instilling that in everyone I think is just fundamental to the show vibe, so. This guy. <laughs> I really love that mentality. Do you feel like that's like the natural momentum of like future DreamWorks features? I, yeah, and it's it's been in all. Of, so the pandemic made it challenging, but I mean, uh, you know, Sandra and I we were able to work on Abominable together. Um, I think every every film we try and I think all the leadership yeah. is really good about trying to make sure that you know. So I, the good thing is we have such a talented base of artists, and it was really I think uh, exciting on on Puss and Boots in particular, but other shows as well, you let them shine, like do their work, right? And so they bring ideas to the table that you want to put in the film because they're great artists. And so I think it's always just kind of keeping that up in mind in terms of the creative leadership. And we had a great team in terms of Mark Swift and Joel and Daniel and, and all of our, yeah, like top leadership, so. Yeah. But I think uh, credit I to you guys, I mean, I've been on a lot of productions where, you know, it's always really, um, you know, the collaboration is still is there. I think this movie to me was very special. Um, I felt like it was like an extra. It was like an extra it's thing. Yeah. Because we also had no time. True, true. We had but to we also <laughs> had to <laughs> hold together. Like, um, but no, I, I don't know. I, I kind of. I mean, I felt like you you drove like all the head of departments and all the artists involved in the, the meetings to kind of be collaborative. And so I think the so directors. So really, you force them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly. He looks very nice like that, but he's not. <laughs> no, and, and the directors were really collaborative, yeah. too, which I think, I think yeah. made a huge difference. Departments like to share, too. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. David talked about that stamp map thing, but that ended up becoming integral to the surfacing department, and they ended up using that to create so much of what you saw on the screen. So it's the collaboration between the departments um, just coming together. And it comes from upper management. It's yeah. just a thing at DreamWorks where we collaborate, we share as much yeah. as we can between artists and departments so that we can get the most beautiful image possible up on that screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like for CFX, it's between lighting and animation, clearly. <laughs> so, like... <laughs> we, we knock on each other's <laughs> doors. All yeah. the time. But then, yeah, it's all about what we are getting, how is it working from us from animation, if that is working for lighting, what we are giving to them, if it is looking bad in lighting, then we get back it again. So all these things, you know, it's like, a, and yeah, Mark is the person who's like, oh, no, 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 it's, <laughs> it's gonna work in lighting, oh, no, no, it's gonna work in animation, so yeah, yeah definitely he's the one. Thank you. All right, so just to let you all know, we got nine more questions. Oh. Okay. okay. Yes. So here's our timeline. One okay. per life. I already, yeah. we're, we're locked in, y'all. Yeah. Nine more nine lives. We're good. Nine lives. Okay. Are you all ready? <laughs> you got your, got your lightning route seatbelts oh, on? The wolf is coming. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question about the wall of fire. I'm not familiar with 3D, so I wanted to know when we were looking at that slide where it showed the proxy, but then also all the, I guess, layers built on the fire. I just want to know the thought process behind that and what each of those layers were. Like there was real fire, but then there'd be the colors and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Uh, um, what we were sort of looking at there were just some snapshots that I took of like our entire process. So when we were working on that section, uh, we wouldn't see any of the layers that were broken out in that clip there. We'd go from point A to point B. And so what we were seeing sort of iteratively flash uh, across the screen was me trying to demonstrate what that process was doing. Um, and the TLDR is sort of, we were taking a fire simulation, which is typically rendered as a volume, and we were turning that into pol polygonal geometry, and then flattening that geometry down to give us just like a flat card, uh, or like a 2D shape, so that we could sort of carve away at the edges or you know, modify the shape in a 2D way so that uh, we could get it to fit in the world of Puss in Boots a bit better. Does that help? Hi, um, I have two questions. Um, I assume the first simulation is uh, proprietary. Uh, yes. I was wondering, do you get to see anything in, in near real time or you have to wait hours for the simulation? And do you watch uh, guide hairs first before you do the full fur? 
Yeah, we do watch, but then no, we don't have to really wait hours. It's a proprietary simulator that we use in there, and I won't say it's 100% real time, but it's pretty close to that. Like we have mechanisms inside where we can see how it actually looks like. We call it like like a WIS system that we have developed, and we don't really need to wait for the renders. We can actually see how it looks like in the scene file itself. So that really saves us a lot of time, you know, kind of not have to wait for every iteration out in the render, and we can just straight away see in the viewport. Oh, that's so that fantastic. does help, yeah. The second question is, uh, did you use depth of field? And if so, was it a, uh, in the render or in the comp? Yes, so we have an option where we can turn it on and off for depth of field. It depends because sometimes when we see the for two blur, like not even seeing the motions and stuff like that, it's hard for our approvals to kind of see it and approve it, so we turn it off. Like, like we have shown uh, Mark, number of times where the depth of field was turned off, especially those hair raising shots, if you saw that lighting showed you, because yeah. it was just getting hazy and the smaller first couldn't be visible at that point. But then that's a choice. Like end of the day, it's lighting, who decides that how much depth of field it should be there on the fur based on the look. But we yeah. as a CFX department, we might want to turn it off just to show our work, you know, it's neater or cleaner or the lines are straighter. So yeah, it's a choice. As, as a general setup, we, we did, have it for the film now too, in, in terms of, so it was always uh, really determined early even in previs, right, in terms of co composing the shot and what the shot was about, and that would sort of feed down through departments and ultimately to lighting, and uh, we do just for speed, 2D comp process, so. Yeah, I don't think we had to render any DOF on this show, maybe a couple shots. No, the, the hard thing is again, like, and we did a lot of early tests of like, should we use traditional blur? Should we try different things? We, um, we had very specific bokeh shots, right, where we actually just cheated, cheated in crazy shapes, right, to get something stylized. So uh, it was uh, kind of like Sandra mentioned, every single piece we said, well, this is how we'd normally do it. What is the Puss in Boots stylization? And so depth of field fell into that as well in certain moments. Um, hello. Um, I was wondering that for those that are starting out in animation um, and they dream to eventually work in a company like DreamWorks, Netflix, or Sony, what advice could you give those, like to those that want to become, <laughs> like work in your position one day? Wow, okay, <laughs> cool, no pressure. Uh, it's like what, life number three? Uh, again, I, I think, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think having that goal, right? I mean, I think to me the, the, the main thing that I would say is like, you can keep that as a goal. I think you can, you can have fun and, and, and really develop yourself as an animator and, and, and learn a lot of different things in different environments, right? So, I mean, obviously DreamWorks, uh, Pixar, Disney, Netflix, I mean, bigger studios are always kind of the goal, but I think to me it's just like, keep at it, like, you know, keep at it. Um, work. I mean, th to me, the practice is really the main thing. I mean, I, I, in my experience, I know that I, I, if I, if I know that I'm going to learn a new thing in animation, I'm going to practice it, and 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 I'm going to learn my lesson, and then and then move to the other assignment and kind of try try to get better the, the next time, right? So it's really just getting there, like just keep keeping keeping the keeping the passion. Um, I think it, it's it's going to happen. Like some some. Uh, some people, like in our department, like some people actually came at DreamWorks very early. I got, I got lucky already to, to, get, to get in there really early. Uh, but we have a lot of animators that, that you know, work five, six, seven, eight years in, in different companies, smaller companies, different, um, you know, video games, VFX, uh, uh, other studios all around the world. And then when they come in, like they come in with like their own background and new things, right? And, uh, us, for, for the people that have been at DreamWorks for a little while, you get a lot of fresh blood, a lot of like fresh, you know, vision on how we can approach the work. So I think any experience is valuable um, as long as you're, you feel like you're happy where you are and, you know, whatever work you're going to pick up or whatever position you're going to pick up, where you wanna go, you're going to pick up, you're going to learn something from it. I, I would also say just, th and this is about really any craft, right? You, you got to do, right? Like do get feedback and continue to, to improve because I, I think right now we're lucky there's, there are a lot of resources out there, right? You can download rigs if you wanna try something, right? You get a student version of mine. There's all these options and you really just gotta 
go for it and do it, right? And that's the same for writing and painting and yeah. you know everything. Like you really got to do. And so don't don't be afraid and don't be afraid to get feedback and critique and kind yeah. of you know edit yourself. And and one thing that I would say it's a good point. I didn't think about it. Feedback. Get feedback, but listen to the feedbacks. I think one thing that I see sometimes, like people want feedback, you give feedback, and then they get ignored because, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Like, where's the feedback come from, right? It, it might not be, the feedback might not be exact, right? But then why is the person giving you that feedback? It might, the solution might be different than maybe the person suggests, but, and it's the same for us. You know, we talk to directors, and sometimes we get a note, and I'm like, I don't get it. But then, to me, I'm like, I get the note, I do it. And most of the time, I do the note, and it makes sense when I do it. It didn't make sense when I studied it, <laughs> but then I did it. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I understand why they wanted this, right? So I think that's also another point is like, you know, be open to those feedbacks. Also, s lean into your strengths. If you are not good at animating, don't keep pushing yourself to try to be an animator. Like, really decide what gives you that passion and what gives you the pleasure and where your strengths lie. Are you good at math? Pick up a little computer science along the way. Are you really good at drawing? Practice those life skill, life drawing skills, you know, those sorts of things. Lean into that. Yeah, we've all had different stories, right? <laughs> sort of coming through, so. I have a computer science degree with a minor in art and I started as a technical director of programming, right? And then I fell in love with lighting, and I spent years in the lighting department, right? But that was like, I had to find that way, so. Uh, hello again. So I have two questions regarding the software. Uh, one, you mentioned that animating five seconds takes a week, which is insane, but understandable. Uh, well, I was wondering, is that with or without the plugins? like a tool studio library and what is the general policy of using such plugins in a studio such as dreamworks can we do it personally or does the studio provide them and second question what software you use for animation and rigging maya blender what's the goods so i'll, I'll answer the second question because it's gonna probably answer the first one as well so animation software at dreamworks is proprietary so we have our own um and there's no restriction on what the tools we're using because it's pretty, they're pretty much in the software, right? So, um, so yeah, five, three to five seconds of animation is basically what what we schedule people on, and depending on the shot, they, if the shot has like five characters in the shot, they animate five characters. If the shot is only one character talking, it's only one character talking. So we adjust that based on the speed. Uh, when you say it's insane, I don't know wh which way. <laughs> For me, it feels pretty fast. If you think it's slow, then I mean we're we're, we're we're, we're asking a lot to our animators. Like, I mean, our software being providing, you know, the, the, the clip you were, you were seeing with posts kind of being scaled around with the tracks. Like, that's how we visualize the characters and we, we pretty much have real-time feedback animating that way. So that really helps us kind of iterate and, 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 and get the animation done. But yeah, there's no restriction on, on the plugins or anything because everything is basically developed in-house and, right. and for the software. So. But, but as a big company, I'll put on the lawyer hat, like, no, we don't just get to download whatever and install, like, everything has to go through an evaluation yes. process and be, you know, blessed by the company to use. But. <laughs> so my question is pretty quick. Um, have you guys, when you're working on a project like this, are you working on multiple projects at once, or is it just Puss in Boots and additionally, um, you mentioned that you animated something like 30 minutes over the last 15 years. How do you in the field <laughs> That's gonna um, get some <laughs> sense of ownership over your projects if you're working on short bursts or such specific detail-oriented work? Yeah, th I mean, well, I'll, I'll quickly answer the animation part. I mean, so uh, as artists, I mean, we, an we only work on a specific project for, you know, the duration of the assignment. So, I mean, being a head of animation on the movie, I spent two and a half years on it. Uh, I have a similar story than Zandra, like my, my wife was just got, you know, we got our son. Our son was born like a month after I started on the movie and he was two and a half years old when the movie came out, <laughs> which was kind of funny. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is like you still get, you still get a lot of ownership. Like the, w the way we do, the way we work at DreamWorks for animators, and I mean, again, I mean, putting that in perspective, I, 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 I did spend 15 years, uh, close to 15 years at DreamWorks. I worked on maybe like, I don't know, 12 movies, 13 movies, but some movies I spent two and a half years on, and I, as a head of animation, I did 
didn't animate much, right? Because I, I, animators did the work and I animated very, very little. Some other projects animated more. Um, but I think the goal that the, the way we do it at DreamWorks, at least, like when we cast animators, we, we usually cast multiple shots at the same time. So they have a moment, they have a moment of the movie. And animators really love it because they feel like they have ownership of, of that specific moment. Um, and, then, and then people, when they, when they finish a project, they, they actually kind of got to develop a part of the, of the movie. Um, I think it, it really depends on the position, right? So like I was on Puss in Boots for like three and a half years or something because I was on really early, right, and run through. But, you know, like a lighter on a lighting team may come on in the last six months to do their lighting and then six months later they're on to the next show. So we, we tend to try not to, it's really hard to balance multiple shows because there's so many unique aspects to them. So we try not to cast people across shows, but. Yeah, but, but to, to complement part of your question, like the, the studio itself have multiple movies at the same Absolutely, time, right? Yeah. So, so you, once, once Puss in Boots is full production, there's another movie that starts and maybe another movie that finishes. And then we kind of roll people on and off uh, movies. So like Mark was saying, dep depending on the position, we have animators starting with us and stay on the movie a year and a half. We have some people coming in in the last four months to have finishing, and then they might just you know spend more time on the next show, et cetera, et cetera. Da David will have like five times as many credits as I will in the, <laughs> yes. in the span. Yes. So. Fantastic. So our final questions of the evening are right here. I appreciate y'all's patience. They're right here. These are the last two, and then we'll let you all go. You, you, you ready for it? No pressure. Okay. There <laughs> we go. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. So another question for David from FX. Um, how did you go about implementing some of the principles of the motion and animation that kind of Ludo works with, with stylized uh, motion when you're working with like physics simulations? Man, <laughs> that's, that's a, a that's great question. question. <laughs> that's a very tough question. I mean, that's not unique to Puss in Boots. That's unique to working on all animated features. Um, the motion is often just different, right? And the timing is different. Um, and so we struggle with that on all of our films, I guess. Uh, so I don't know if there's any one particular thing that we did on Puss in Boots uh, specifically to meet the timing, but it's usually sort of dictated by the camera and animation that we receive, I think, uh, what our elements need to be timed by. But there's a lot of technical uh, techniques that we have th that we do use to match the timing and so on. Uh, does that sort of help? Yeah, I guess I'm somewhat curious if you do you do a lot of retiming of physics simulations? Oh, absolutely. Or do you, yeah, yeah, yeah. For do you sure. also have a base of just like keyframing, like things like forces and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything goes. <laughs> My question is for uh, Pramita, and I was wondering before CFX where you were in your career and um, transitioning into CFX, what stuff you found more like the most important, uh, and what you had to work on the most to make that transition. Well, I started as a rigging artist. That's how I started. And then I migrated to CFX. So for me, it was like, you know, when you're a rigging artist, you kind of understand the anatomy, you kind of understand the technology behind it. But then when I came to CFX, it's more, more about like tech meets art because I also have to understand the art because it's in motion at that point. So I really like the blend, like the transition, like in rigging, you just rig it, right? It's very static, you're building assets, it's very technical. But then CFX, you get to do both. You need to understand the technology of using it in terms of satisfying the art and the creativity that you're asked for. So that blend really, you know, lets me keep going in CFX more and more because I get to do best of both. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again. Thank you. They loved it so much, I didn't even have to say give it up. But give it up, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all so much for attending, and thank you for tuning in live. We will see you all next time.